Right, uh, we'll get underway. Uh, thank you for those who um, have uh, come along to participate in this webinar in relation to the government's three water reform proposal. Uh, my name's Tim King, uh, the Mayor of the Tasman District, and with me today is Richard Kirby, who's the Group Manager for Community Infrastructure. The format of um, today's session is that we're going to do a presentation, which is anticipated to take um, roughly 25 minutes. And at the end of that time, there's been a number of questions submitted uh, over the course of the last few days that we will work through and we will share those on the screen so people can see the questions that have been asked and we'll go through and provide answers to those. If you want to ask further questions, um, please use the Q&A option uh, that's available and we will try and get through as many of those as we can in the time that we have. We're aiming to finish about 6.30. Uh, and if there's nothing, if there's questions that arise that we haven't answered during the course of that, we will get back to people and share those answers up on our website. A full recording uh, of today's webinar and also the slides that are going to be shared and worked through and the information contained with them will also be on the website after the um, meeting. So with that, I will uh, go through and we, Richard and I will share the presentation. Uh, we'll put the slides up on the screen now and we'll work through those. So firstly, the government's case for change. So I think most of you have, will have heard about the Havelock North, uh, which is now a number of years ago, and that was really the time that this whole process was kicked off and the government had an inquiry into that. And since that time, um, successive governments have continued to look at the options for the, particularly around water provision across New Zealand. Um, that has led in the term of this government to an analysis by the Water Industry Commission for Scotland, which will be referred to in the balance of this presentation as WICS. And the conclusion of that that the government has come to is that there's a necessity to invest between 120 and $185 billion over the next 30 years in the three waters. And so that now includes the supply of drinking water, uh, the disposal of wastewater, and the provision of stormwater services. Next slide. Some of the costs uh, that have been driven or have been provided as part of that analysis demonstrate or show that the uh, cost to households across New Zealand will increase significantly over the next 30 years based on Wix's assessment of the investment that needs to be made to meet the increasing standards that are going to be expected across the country, across all three waters infrastructure. It's also uh, born out of the information that rural councils with widely dispersed populations and multiple schemes are likely to be uh, affected the most by the increase in costs. And the analysis um, demonstrates or shows that household costs will range from just under $1,900 to an excess of $8,000 by 2050 across the country. The modelling that Wix has done is not based on business as usual, and it takes into account a number of changes that are either anticipated or already in train. Chief amongst these are the New Zealand standards that apply, the, dedicated, the creation of a dedicated drinking water regulator, Taumata Arawai, the passage of the Water Services Bill, National Policy Statement on Freshwater Management. It also doesn't include a number of items um, that are covered by the Water Services Bill. Chief amongst those is the possible impact of community water supplies transferring across to water service providers uh, should they not be able to meet the new standards. And we'll touch more on this in a later slide. This has led to the government's proposal, which we are now considering as council and being asked to provide feedback on. I think it's important at this stage to point out we're not being asked to make a decision at this point as to whether to opt in or opt out. That decision may be um, in front of council in the future, should the government choose to uh, go down a path or retain the pathway of opt in or opt out, as has been discussed to this point in the process. 
They've also indicated that they don't see a direct government funding um, option being available, i.e. direct government funding into existing water services providers, such as councils. That they do see the solution being aggregation and on a scale that is anticipated through this proposal. And that has been based on the Scottish water experience and the government's assessment of a number of other water service aggregations uh, particularly in Australia over the last uh, number of years. The aggregation model that's being proposed um, is four entities across the country, three of which have very similar population included. The obvious outlier being Entity A with the inclusion of Auckland, which has a significantly greater population. What it also results in is a range of different anticipated costs across those four entities, the lowest of which is Entity A with the inclusion of Auckland, which is anticipated to be around the $800 mark, through to Entity D, which is the bulk of the South Island, excluding Top of the South, Nelson, Mulgrew and Tasman, where the anticipated cost is $1,640. The comparison that the government has done and the information that's been provided assesses that without reform, those costs across those four areas are likely to range between $2,000 and $5,000. One of the other challenges that we face, particularly in this region, is that the boundary that's been suggested currently separates both Tasman and Marlborough across two entities. Uh, and this is a key area that we've provided feedback to the government on as part of the feedback council discussed today. So we looked at the uh, government proposal. Um, the government undertook some peer reviews of the proposal that uh, Wix had uh, put to them. And uh, Ferris Weir undertook a peer review, their economics consultant uh, from Australia, who have had a lot of experience in the water industry in Australia. And they note that uh, significant efficient improvements are possible through aggregation and associated reforms. There was also a peer review undertaken by uh, Beckers. Uh, Beckers is a New Zealand engineering consultant, and they suggested that even with Wix modeling forecasts, that they may underestimate the investment required and the timeframes. And as Mayor Tim has indicated, this is largely around the increased standards that are going to be required, not only for drinking water, but for wastewater disposal, treatment and disposal, and stormwater uh, disposal. So the only comment we have on that is that the modelling suggests extra investment will be required, and I think that probably goes without saying. I mean, there may be a case for change. However, the government has said it's a compelling case for change, but from a from financial perspective, we believe that there may be a case for change, but not as compelling. So this is the dashboard that uh, Wix has presented for uh, Tasman District. And it has taken the information that we gave them back in February this year on our current financial information. And they've assessed across the three waters that the average household cost per year at the moment is $2,290. Now, there's a lot of averages and assumptions on this because not everyone has all three services supplied. Um, but they've taken the number of connections within each of those three services, averaged that out, taken all the costs and averaged that out, and that's where this figure has come from. They've then predicted that in 2051, 30 years' time, that if council actually went on its own, that those costs would rise to $6,760 per household per year. Um, that's in today's dollars. And that if uh, we went into reform, um, as part of NCTC, that those costs would uh, drop to $1,260 per household per annum. There's a whole lot of factors behind this. And um, one of the key factors is, is that Wix have assumed that the efficiencies gained through the reforms would probably be about 2% per year over the 30 years, which equates with as compounded about 45% savings. And so we have some questions about that as well. If we go to the, uh, the Wix information, um, Morris and Lowe, who have been working for local government New Zealand and have done some work for a lot of councils around the country, have undertaken a sensitivity analysis for us. 
This particular graph here has got a lot of figures on it, and I'm just going to summarize them um, quickly. If you look at the blue box, Entity C, we see at the moment there that the Entity C, the base case per household per year is $1,260. If the efficiencies that Wix predicts the 45% efficiencies, if only 50% of those are achieved, that cost would go up to $1,685 in 2051. If council went alone and utilized the Wix information um, as they predicted, then you end up with a figure at the far right of 6,172. That's slightly different to what I just showed you before because the number of uh, connections that we've included have been the connections from the last uh, year, ended, ended two months ago, compared with the uh, WIX data from the year before. But you can see there that, uh, that that's what they've predicted, but if there are some, um, some savings, um, in other words, or if there are investments, if the investments that WIX have projected are only 50% of when you believe that we have to invest 50% of what they project, then the cost will drop to 3,095 per household per year in 2051. And if only 25% of that investment is required, it drops to 2,005. It's interesting to note that uh, in the blue box at the bottom there, our infrastructure strategy at the moment, the 30 year infrastructure strategy has identified investment over that 30 years and it equates to around 2,140 per household per year. So you can see when you look at that 2,140 that Wix assumptions on investment are, is significantly greater, almost three times as great as what, uh, as what council has predicted in its own budgets at the moment. So if we look at the asset values that we've got currently, um, and this is a table just showing the different asset values. So the replacement value on our books at the moment um, for all three activities is the $634 million. The depreciated replacement value is currently $442. That was at the 30th of June, 2020. Um, we do these valuations, we've um, formalized them every three years. Um, so that's the depreciated, and annual depreciation is 9,525,000. Now you look on the right-hand side, there's uh, the average life of the different assets and stormwater, which is learned to be hard for structure pipes and the like, has a longer average life for all the components. But the other two activities, the, the average life is a lot less. Wix have indicated in their uh, assessments and their modeling that we have overestimated the life of our assets and they believe the average is more like 45 years. So that being the case, obviously the appreciation increases by that, uh, by that proportion and that's why the extra investment is, has been indicated. If we start looking at the forecasts on what would happen uh, if uh, with council's uh, finances, if we don't transfer the assets, and this is in our LTP, and the LTP on the 30th of June 21, we had a, a, an actual uh, net debt of 152 million, and we're predicting that will be 248 million by the 1st of July 2024. If, the, if we just look at three waters on their own within their current finances, at the moment, the three waters debt is at 30th of June 21 was 90.1 million. And we're predicting that will be 114.2 million in three years time. Now, if we were to take the three waters out of the council's books and transfer them across the to new, new entity, our net debt um, as at 30th of June would have been 61.9 million. And in three years' time, it would be 138 million. So there's the reduction from the 248 that we've got in our LTP at the moment. And the other figures on there are just uh, debt to ratio. And I'm not going to go into those details at the moment. They're there for your information, but that's roughly what Wix have, uh, have, have, have applied to some of their modeling, is making sure that the debt to revenue ratio doesn't go above a certain level. So in July, the government announced some funding packages. Um, basically, they've announced three funding packages. The first one was a $2 billion better off package, they called it, um, to support local councils to invest in their community's well-being. And Tasman has been allocated $22.543 million. The formula that's been uh, derived for that works on the area of the councils, the population of the councils, and the deprivation index. So they've applied that formula across the country to work out how that $2 billion is to be allocated. 
There's also a $500 million um, funding package, a no worse off package, to ensure that in the reforms, um, councils will not be worse off. And these are to fund largely stranded assets, overheads and the like, if three waters were to be taken off council's books. The third funding package, and the government hasn't actually confirmed this figure, though indications are there's going to be in the area of 300 million, and that'll be allocated across the councils to cover reasonable transition costs, the, the work that councils have to do in transitioning the three waters across should the reforms go ahead. It is interesting to note that uh, of the 2.5 billion, the, two, the first two funding packages, 1.5 billion of that is going to be funded from the proposed four water service entities. So in effect, the councils are going to be getting funding that are going to be paid for by the users of those assets within the four WSEs. The Crown is only putting $1 billion into this. PWS and PWC estimate for Tasman District Council with these three packages that we'll get approximately $32 million, though obviously there will be some of that will be funding costs that we that have already highlighted in, in this in this package. And I'll hand back to Tim to talk through the governance structures for the entities. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, so one of the key areas of focus and I guess one of the key areas of feedback that we've received from the community over the, um, the last few weeks is around this particular part of the proposal, which is the structure. As you can see from the board um, uh, from the slide, it is very complex. Uh, and one of the many challenges uh, that we face is just how local communities, uh, whether that's the council or communities directly or consumers and customers of these future entities, may be able to have input influence uh, on the decisions that they make. And so the significant part of the feedback that um, councils around the country and we are making is around this. So as you can see, what is um, being designed and what is being proposed is that ownership uh, will sit with local authorities. And I know there's a lot of um, debate over exactly what that ownership means. Uh, councils, in, so the owners, which in Entity C, I think is 22 councils, in conjunction with Mana Whenua Iwi, will um, be represented on the regional representative group. That group then appoints and monitors an independent selection panel, which appoints and monitors the board that will ultimately make decisions uh, on the entity around the future uh, investments, operational costs, management, et cetera, of the entity that will, at that point, be managing the Three Waters infrastructure. Um, there are a couple of key things that probably need to be pointed out. Uh, one is that, uh, EWI are not being proposed as owners, and I know that is a concern that has come through, but they will have under this a significant role in the management and operations of the entities going forward. I think one of the key points that's come out of this and the concerns that have been raised is that under this model, it's very hard to see uh, any of the people in the top two boxes being able to have a very significant amount of influence over the decisions that are made day to day by the entity itself, given the complexity and the number of steps that are between owners uh, and the board itself. The left-hand boxes contain a number of the uh, other entities that are either currently in existence or anticipated to be created that will have a role in um, both the future funding decisions and the role that consumers and residents and ratepayers will have in influencing this body. One of those is the economic regulator yet to be created um, that will look at the charging and costing models that these entities run uh, and oversee that to ensure uh, that they are uh, managed appropriately. The consumer body is where local customers and consumers of these entities will go to where they should they have concerns uh, about their, um, their service provision. Regional councils will continue to monitor uh, the water takes and the RMA related issues that relate primarily to water supply, discharge consents and standards and stormwater discharge consents and standards. 
and Taumata Arawai, which is also uh, now in existence, which is the new Three Waters Regulator created in, by the government over the last 12 months, will have a role in setting the standards, particularly around drinking water, where they take over the role that has traditionally been uh, delivered by district health boards, but they will also have a role in monitoring and enforcing standards that relate to the other two waters, i.e. wastewater and stormwater. The key role of the regional representation representative group will be to set the strategic performance expectations, approve a statement of intent, and have input into the key planning and strategic documents that the entity produces. In this space, there is a requirement for a 75% majority of those um, representatives on that group uh, to make changes. As anticipated in the reforms that those groups will involve a maximum of 12 people uh, with a preference for 10. And I guess, as you can see, with 22 councils and a significant number of mana whenua iwi, uh, not everyone is going to have a direct role in that discussion. A couple of the other key things that will impact on this are the Tamana O to Y statement. So that is the, um, the government's approach to freshwater management. Uh, so that will have a significant role, particularly in wastewater discharge and stormwater standards going forward. Well, obviously there's a key focus on uh, cost. Uh, there's also a number of other things that councils are going to have to consider and communities are going to have to weigh up as we work through the next steps in this reform process. And they are set out here in this matrix. Obviously there's the services that are received, uh, finance and funding, the social and community wellbeing part of it, and the workforce delivery and capability. So all of these factors are going to need to be taken into account as both the community and councils consider what the next steps might be uh, once we hear back from the government on the um, information that all councils are expected to provide back by the, uh, today or tomorrow actually. Council met today uh, and considered a report that's been uh, in the public domain for the last week um, and passed some resolutions. I'm not going to go through them all because a number of them have uh, already been out, but they included a number of extra ones today, which I will touch on. One was uh, agree that the reforms as currently proposed do not respond to concerns expressed by this and other councils and that if those concerns are not addressed, councils would likely not support the reform program as currently proposed. The second inclusion was um, along the lines, uh, a number of the council has requested an extension in the time frame to consider a whole range of issues that are outlined, won't go through them all, but they included a new one today, which is a consideration of alternatives. The third uh, new uh, statement as relates to the support council may give is likely to be subject to the council's interest in the Waimea Community Dam, the associated rights and financial commitments being transferred, otherwise council would likely opt out subject to public consultation. And the last one was agreeing that the inclusion of stormwater presents particular problems and a full examination of the impacts and options and costs including on council's roading, regulatory and parks and reserves functions as required. So there are a range of topics that I think all councils around the country are likely to go back with the, to the government with concerns over. Uh, there's a huge range of views, as I'm sure you're aware, between councils from those who have chosen to effectively indicate an opt out at this stage through to those who are supportive of the proposals and everything in between. The topics that we have put forward for further discussion are the ownership and governance model, how to ensure local voices continue to be heard, council statutory obligations and the processes around consultation that uh, may be covered or may be available for us um, based on what the government's decisions are around next steps, what the stormwater flood protection assets and activities, how they would transfer and how this would work given the complexities and the links to parks and reserves and roading assets how the risk of privatisation is going to be managed, recognising and embedding local priorities going forward, and a number of others. These last two slides, I guess, indicate uh, 
the key steps the government has outlined. You will note that the timing uh, refers to 1 July 30th of June. Uh, we've obviously already passed that time. And we now await government's feedback over the next month. They've indicated that they will provide some decisions uh, and feedback on all the information they're receiving from councils at the end of this month uh, over the October. Um, we look forward to that feedback and the decision that the government makes around next steps. So this slide, okay. this slide actually just talks about what happens from here on in. This um, timeline was presented uh, by the government late last year. Um, they haven't updated this timeline. Um, and you'll note from here that uh, councils opting in and opting out was supposed to be was supposed to have been done by now. Um, and that obviously is not happening. Um, the government has asked for feedback and delayed the process by eight weeks to allow councils to provide that feedback. So we're expecting the government to announce a new timeline uh, next month on what their proposals are going forward. So just before I go into working through the list of questions, which we'll now put up uh, on the slides, uh, please do, if you have further questions and answers, put them in the question and answers box and hopefully we'll get to those if they're not covered in terms of the questions that have been submitted previously. I would just like to highlight that over the last um, probably six weeks, we have received a huge amount of feedback. Uh, over the last 48 hours, we've received uh, hundreds of emails from a wide range of people across the region expressing a wide range of concerns uh, about the proposals. Uh, and the council is certainly uh, wide awake to those considerations and has tried as much as possible uh, to build them into the feedback we've provided to government and make it clear that the feedback we've received to date uh, has not been positive. I'll now go through the questions in order. Firstly, will the new entity have a local presence? Our anticipation is that it, it most certainly will. Uh, it has been indicated that the current staff that are involved are likely to retain their current terms and conditions and location. And that indicates to us that there's almost certain to be a local presence in the region. What money is being provided by the government for the proposal? Richard has outlined in a previous slide, there is a range of uh, funding mechanisms that are being proposed. Uh, the, an estimated uh, total for this council is approximately $32 million across those three uh, different funding proposals that government has put forward. As Richard also highlighted, $1.5 billion of that is being generated by the entities themselves and hence paid for uh, by those who will ultimately be charged for and connected to the various uh, three waters in the region. What happens to schemes that are not connected to a reticulated supply or system? There's a number of questions that touch on this, and this is where the three waters proposal and the water services bill um, are both important. So it's the water services bill that determines uh, what might happen to uh, those supplies that are not connected to a reticulated system. Uh, and so community supplies, as defined by the Water Services Bill, are any of those water supplies that serve two or more people. So the water, the three waters reform itself does not directly impact on those not connected to a reticulated or council supplied system, but they may be um, impacted based on the water services bill implication. And I'll touch on that and answer to a next, another question further down. Where is council going to spend the $22 million? Uh, no decisions have been made. Uh, that money would only come in to council uh, should the reform go ahead uh, and at a point in time uh, in the future. What has been indicated is that that money does need to be considered in conjunction with um, uh, iwi, and so how that funding is spent will not be entirely up to council to make a determination on. So as yet, there is no, it is open as to where it's spent, so it is not restricted in terms of how it is spent, but there is a process to go through to consider where it might be spent. Why can't we have an entity for the top of the south? 
So this uh, was certainly something that was considered early on in the process and right around the country, different um, councils um, across the country have considered either in depth or certainly uh, discussed the option of regional aggregation. It became apparent early on in the process that that wasn't going to satisfy the government's, the government's um, requirements around scale and their view on what efficiencies, uh, what size these entities needed to be to drive the efficiency and cost savings. And so that work has not progressed further. And certainly it remains one of the things that councils have gone back and asked government about, um, should there be a consideration of other alternatives than the current proposal? Will all debt go to the new entity? Uh, it is anticipated that all the debt um, that is associated with three waters will transfer to the new entity. Will our water rates be reduced? Uh, I guess that is one of the large questions. The modelling that the government has proposed or provided indicates that over time, the cost will be less if we're uh, in these new entities than if we remain alone. And it is also our, our understanding that these entities will charge directly in the future for these services. So while water rates, councils' water rates are likely to disappear, they will be replaced with direct charges from the entities for the water, three water services. How will the entities borrow money? Uh, so the entities will borrow money um, as councils do now based not on the equity that's provided by the assets. Um, councils borrow money based on the security of the rating mechanism and our ability to rate to recover the costs. And it's anticipated that these entities will be able to borrow based on the government backing. Uh, so again, not borrowing against the equity of the assets that they will uh, take over, but based on the backing that the government provides them and the security that that offers whoever they might choose to borrow from. Uh, be that the local government funding agency, should that be an option as currently councils borrow from, or from private um, the private market and banks. What right does the government have to take over water assets? Um, I guess the answer to that is they are the government. And should they pass legislation, which they would need to do in order to uh, implement this proposal, uh, then they have that, I guess they have that right as the government. Can you go back to, can private schemes opt out of oh, council option? Right. That's fine, no problem. Uh, can private schemes opt out of council option? Again, this relates to the water services bill. So private schemes will not be included in the three waters reform. So they will not be automatically included. Uh, the impact is if, the, if they cannot comply with the water services bill and the standards that sit in there in relation to the provision of uh, drinking water, the default position is that they will um, effectively come across to the water supply or water services entity. That would mean if the status quo remains or a version of it, they would actually come across to council to manage. And if the reform goes ahead, they would then potentially come across to the new entity. But that is part of the water services bill, not specifically part of the three waters reform. Will there be a referendum? At this stage, the council has determined that they don't see a referendum uh, being undertaken. There absolutely will need to be um, full consultation with the community through the special consultative procedure. And also there will need to be a legislative change because currently councils are unable to divest or transfer their water supply assets to another non-council owned entity. Uh, so there's a number of legislative changes. Council significance policy requires that we consult the community uh, should we get the option, a choice over whether we transfer these assets in the future. And there was one other thing on that one too, Tim, that the council raised today was that a referendum is, is a referendum of today with people involved only over 18, whereas uh, a referendum may not consider the future generations, intergenerational work on a decision like this. So the council felt that uh, a decision that they needed to make a decision in that regard, and a referendum may not give that um, they give that reflection. 
uh, how will Tasman needs be met by an entity covering such a large area? So this is one of the crucial areas of feedback that we've received and that we've provided back to the government. Um, there is a significant concern about just how the priorities of a region like uh, Tasman are going to be delivered on by an entity that is trying to cover such a large area and is inevitably going to have a huge amount of competing priorities. So again, we don't know the answer to how will our needs be met, but it's a key area of concern and it is partially reflected in the feedback we've provided over governance. With the separation being so significant between ownership and the ultimate decision making by the board, um, it does leave a significant question over how regional needs will be met and how communities will be able to have input into that process. How is the debt in the dam going to be managed when it is owned, owed by different parties? So again, uh, our expectation is that any debt that is owed by the council um, in the Waimea Community Dam would be transferred across, but clearly the debt that is owed by uh, our joint venture partner, uh, Waimea Irrigators Limited, um, is not going to be transferred across to the water supply entity um, as currently proposed. And that will preside, present some challenges to work through. Will there be redundancies in the transfer of roles and will those people be rehired later to the new entity? It is likely that, uh, well, the government has indicated very clearly that there will be no redundancies and that all staff who are currently employed um, largely in councils across these three waters uh, services will be transferred across on the same terms and conditions and in the same locations as they are now. And it's also indicated that there's likely to be significantly more people employed mm. in the provision uh, of the investments that the government and Wix's analysis believe need to be made over the next 30 years. Yes, can I just add to that that capacity and capability is one of the key things uh, with this particular reforms. And it's not just the reforms, it's just the new standards that are be going to be required if council stays alone or if it goes into the water services entity, there are going to be staffing requirements and capacity and capability to, to meet the new requirements. Uh, what is the definition of a private scheme that could come under control of the new entities? And again, this relates back to the water services bill uh, and the definition that is currently contained of community water supplies, which you could read as private schemes. Um, is that it is any scheme that provides water to two or more um, properties. So that includes a wide range of situations, whether that's um, farms with multiple dwellings, uh, multiple properties who share a supply, uh, and a number of smaller private community supplies uh, where water is provided to um, a number of households by a single supplier. But again, that is where the Water Services Bill, which is currently in process, uh, and Taumata Arawa as a drinking water regulator, um, have a significant impact on the future decisions, not specifically the Three Waters reform process. What value has the Wix model brought in terms of New Zealand's Three Waters reforms, in terms of comparative analysis? There is a massive amount of information um, contained in the Wix modelling, uh, and it includes a consideration of a, a range of different models and scales. Um, and then there has subsequently been a lot of analysis done, in some cases by individual councils, by local government New Zealand, utilising a number of consultants, uh, many of whom have raised questions and concerns over Wix modelling. Uh, and DIA and Wix have then provided some subsequent analysis of that. So, look, I think there has been value provided um, through the, the Wix modelling, but as we have highlighted in both our feedback and a number of other councils have highlighted, uh, it is a very, it's a very, uh, I guess, high level model in many ways. Um, it implements and considers and utilises information um, from other jurisdictions which aren't necessary analogous to the situation we face in New Zealand. Uh, and hence, there is a lot of debate about exactly what the figures uh, mean. I think what most people, what all the analysis does tend to agree on is there is likely to be benefits to some form of aggregation. The scale of those benefits 
uh, is, I guess, where the debate exists. If the government makes the opt-in compulsory, does this cover private schemes? And this is the same answer as I've provided previously. It doesn't in the immediate, it doesn't in relation to the three waters immediately affect private schemes. They may be affected in the future if they cannot comply with the water services bill and tell matter otherwise um, drinking water standards requirements. So at this point, we have a number of other questions that have been um, put through and we will now work through those. So uh, working from the top down, uh, one is as a rural resident with 100,000 litres of storage and his own uh, sewage disposal scheme, am I able to get a rebate on any charges that may be levied against me by the three waters concept should it be adopted by the TDC? So at the moment, if you uh, have your own water supply and your own sewerage scheme, then the charges that will be levied against you, council will not be charging you for the provision of those services currently, um, and you won't be charged by the three waters entity for either of those services in the future. The second question, did WICS personnel visit uh, Aotearoa as part of their analysis or was it all desktop? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Yep, the WIC Commissioner did, has visited New Zealand on two or three occasions, but I'm not sure whether the WIC staff have, but certainly the uh, Commissioner himself has been here and he headed up the study. Uh, have the eight Titao Ihu Iwi indicated their views to Council regarding the southern boundary and are they content to be part of Entity C, which lumps us, i.e. Uh, top of the south, with parts of the North Island? Uh, the answer to that is yes, they have. Um, and they have indicated uh, quite strongly that their view is that they would prefer to be part of Entity D or TY Panamu, the South Island entity. Um, council has indicated, or oh, and that the boundary uh, should be, uh, in the absence of that, the boundary should be on the current territorial authority boundaries. Uh, council has agreed. Um, with the boundary decision and council has not stated a preference in its um, feedback as to whether we should be part of entity C or entity D. Uh, that was debated at council today, um, but we have left that open. <coughs> I think it's important to say that the government's made it pretty clear at this stage that there aren't, aren't entertaining a debate about the boundaries between entities, but they are willing to consider and have been engaging with iwi over where the um, the boundary that separates part of Tasman and Marlborough, um, they are continuing to consider where that line may be drawn. Uh, the next question is the Tasman District Council better off package separate to ends Nelson City Council and Marlborough District Council? My understanding is the answer to that is yes. Yep. So each council will receive um, funding under the better off package and the other two packages that were outlined in a previous slide. If you were, uh, to, look, if you were to look at the uh, web, uh, website, the Department of Internal Affairs website on Three Waters, there is a table there showing all the funding, uh, how the two billion's been allocated across all the councils in the country. Uh, how many iwi are within the entity C? Uh, Titao ihu iwi represent eight. Uh, that is a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, significantly more than eight, but I don't know the exact number. Uh, there are 22 councils contained within that entity. Obviously, the eight top of the south iwi uh, in the top of the south, depending on where the line is drawn, uh, that could also involve Naitahu. Uh, but that's an answer that we can provide after this on the website. Good question. Will TDC have a representative on the regional representative group? Again, um, I don't think we can anticipate having one as of right. Um, the indication is that that regional representation group will have a maximum of 12 members and they would prefer 10. And if you think there are 22 councils and a significant number of iwi that need to be accommodated within that, it is um, by no means certain that 
we would have a representative uh, on that group. And that is one of the key areas of feedback that I know I think all councils have um, in terms of feedback to the government on uh, the proposal to date. If the reform goes ahead, will it impact normal rates? Uh, so this is another excellent question and one that's very hard to answer. Um, one of the reasons that a number of councils have provided feedback around the timeframe is that alongside this, there are there is the reform or review of local government. And it depends in a, to a significant degree as to the outcome of that is what the impact will be on other rates. Clearly, um, if the new entities collect their money directly from ratepayers, that will come off the bill that the council sends to people. However, it will simply be replaced with a bill for the same, slightly less or more, um, from the entity that provides water. What the councils then choose to do um, across the balance of their responsibilities uh, in the long term will determine the impact on rates. And I guess there's a wide range of views across local government as to whether um, their needs, local government needs more um, responsibilities or to pick up a different suite of responsibilities to replace the three waters through to the view that should three waters transfer, then local government will need to uh, reduce in its scale and cost because ratepayers and residents will still be paying for the services from the new entity. Uh, and if councils continue to charge the same as they're charging now, then that raises the whole question of is that affordable to communities combined? So I can't answer, I cannot give a direct kind of question because those decisions will be made down the track by future councils. That's it. I don't think there are any more questions. Right, so um, we do still have uh, 10 minutes. So if there are people on the call or on the webinar that uh, would like to ask some more questions, please um, take the opportunity. Um, this is not the last time that we are likely to be out in the community. This is, I guess, probably the start of this conversation. Um, once we receive feedback from the government, hopefully, um, between now and the end of October on next steps, uh, whether the current proposals um, are changed or altered in any way to reflect the feedback that they have received from across the country, uh, what the time frame looks like going forward. Uh, we are likely to, um, well, we're almost certain, should we be given the option, and this doesn't become mandatory, uh, to be consulting with the community. Um, that is uh, both provided for in the current legislation that covers local government and also within council's um, own policies around significance. So there's a question um, which has just come in, why are local iwi not considered owners under the WIPs proposal for the new entities? Uh, that is a question that I can't provide the answer to. Um, that would be something you would have to address to the um, I guess DIA and the government directly. Um, the proposal has made it quite clear that the ownership will remain, uh, well, ownership, and I'll caveat this heavily with ownership, um, ownership as determined um, by the government in relation to these assets, because there is a huge debate over what that actually means in terms of uh, ownership and control. But uh, the government has determined that local government will remain owners. Uh, Ewe's influence and input will be through that structure that I highlighted earlier, um, through the regional representation group and input into the statement of intent. And I guess is also reflected in the 75% majority that's required for decisions that are made by that group. Do you want me to answer this question? Uh, yes, you may. <laughs> The question is, uh, the Tasman District Council is due to get 32 million, 22 million from the New Zealand government taxpayers, which is not quite right, I'll clarify that in a minute, plus 10 million via water service entity, water users. So has the 10 million been built into the Wix cost models? My understanding is the Wix cost models has not accounted for any of the funding that the government has, has highlighted. 
So the 1.5 billion that's going to be invested or going to be funded from the four water service entities, my understanding is that they have not been included in the WICS models because the WICS had completed its models by the time the government had made its announcements. So they wouldn't have been included. So in effect, you can say if you take the WICS models, then the, the water service entities are going to be 1.5 billion in debt on day one when they start. Uh, right, the next question is, uh, does EWE have veto rights to decisions? So um, the way the regional representation group has been structured um, currently is that between 10 and 12 people representing, or 50-50, so either five and five or six and six, um, representing the local authorities as owners and mana whenua iwi, uh, will make up that group and that in order for the, the major decisions in that group, you require a 75% majority. So any three people or any three representatives, um, be that from local government or iwi, uh, would be able to, uh, I guess, effectively veto or um, hold up a decision. So uh, I don't think it specifically relates to iwi having veto rights. It simply means that in order to get a 75% majority, uh, whether that's three of the local government representatives or three of the iwi representatives or two of one and one of the other um, would be able to, um, I guess, frustrate those decisions. Uh, again, it's an area of feedback. Uh, we'll wait to see what the government um, does in terms of that. Uh, but it is, it is a key issue. And I don't have the answer as to why the choice about 75%. I think in part it relates to the fundamental decision about privatisation uh, and they wanted to have a 75% majority um, in order to, I guess, limit the possibility of future privatisation. Uh, why are there so, there are so many unknowns in all of this. What is the difference in this as to what happened with railways, transfer and buyback and the privatisation of electricity? Um, and, gosh, um, in terms of the railways transfer, probably a bit before my time, uh, and so I probably won't comment too much on that. Um, I, I guess there are some parallels in terms of the electricity, um, the electricity process, uh, and that was originally put into publicly owned entities, and then subsequent governments made a decision to privatise those assets. I think the government's been at great pains to point out that they are trying. Um, within the restrictions of what future governments may decide to do and how much you can limit the decisions that a future government may make to try and provide for um, as many hurdles as possible to the future privatisation. Uh, but again, that's probably a question best uh, put to the government uh, and their representatives as opposed to us. Lovely one for you, uh, Mayor King. <laughs> what is Mayor King's opinion about transfer from democratic decision making by voters, one man, one vote basis to a 50 50 co governance model between councils and EWI? <laughs> uh, look, I think it's my biggest concern is not so much about the, the 50 50 and the governance decisions. My key concern is that under this model, uh, neither the, the owners, uh, or Mana Whenua Iwi are likely to be able to have a significant amount of influence over the decisions that are important to people um, in terms of the provision of infrastructure, future costs and regional priorities because of the complexity that has been um, provided for in the um, structure. So I think that's where the focus needs to be is to how do any of the parties that are included actually manage to influence uh, the future decisions. And that is applicable to both uh, the local government representatives um, as owners and to Mana Whenua Iwi as um, partners in the proposal as currently structured. This is, this is an excellent forum, thank you. Is there a platform for Q&As or other consultation as things progress? Uh, look, I think we'll consider, uh, once we get the government's feedback, both based on the feedback that both we and other councils around the country have provided, uh, we'll consider where we go from here. Uh, obviously, that's going to be significantly different if there is some 
uh, central government mandating of these procedures or processes or whether or not councils are going to retain the opt-out option in the future. Uh, but I think we'll certainly consider future opportunities for questions and answers. Provision of information through our website, social media platforms will certainly be something that we will continue to do. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll continue to consider what options we're going to use for further consultation and community input. Another question, Tim, does the council have equity shares in the entity and will council receive dividends? Uh, so no, we will not have equity or shares. And this comes back to the point I made earlier. This is a different form of ownership from, I guess, any traditional sense. So normally you would have a share that may or may not involve the receiving of dividends. Certainly the Tasmanian model um, that we've been um, provided information about and the opportunity to discuss with the Tasmanian um, uh, water services entities uh, is an equity model and they do receive dividends. Uh, the government has made it very clear in this case that our ownership is, I guess, effectively nominal, i.e. it's provided for in legislation but does not attract shares uh, and does, there is no expectation of dividends being received in the future. Another question, why don't you wait until we get back to normal to move such a big change? Um, again, I'm not sure there is going to be a normal. Uh, I think things, uh, there is so much on and, and in the debate today in council, it was touched on that uh, there is so much going on. Um, so whether it's the current situation around the country in relation to uh, COVID and the pandemic and all the issues that that provides, whether it's all the other reforms that are being proposed currently in uh, RMA and local government reform, uh, it's a question I guess many people have as to why now and why such a big change. But that's really a question that needs to be addressed to central government and their representatives. Um, it's a concern, I guess, that we've certainly shared um, on behalf of our community back to government, uh, that this is a huge change. There's a lot on. It's very difficult for people to um, get their head around and provide feedback. The next question, what does the reform mean for those who are not on main water supply? How will those with own supply from wells, bores and springs be affected? Perhaps I could answer that. If you have your own supply and supply your own dwelling, uh, you will not be affected by these reforms. But if you have a supply that's not only doing your dwelling, but you are actually serving another household, then you will be affected to the extent that you have to meet the drinking water standard regulations. And you can actually do that. The Water Services Bill says that if you cannot do that, then your service, your supply will default to either the council or the water service entity, whichever is the water supply authority at the time. Right, and I think this is, given the time, probably the last one. It's actually quite a good question to end on. Uh, no single public, no single publicly owned resource that has been privatised uh, that I'm aware of has actually resulted in lower prices for the public. Is it fair to say the proposed savings um, via, and it says privatisation, I hasten to add that the current proposal is not suggesting it be privatised, um, are hypothetical and so far as they have a target, but the savings are not guaranteed. So I think that is absolutely correct, except for the privatisation component. The figures that have been provided and all the analysis that's been done by different consultants uh, suggest that there is likely to be uh, savings in terms of the aggregation and the model that's been proposed, but there's a wide range of views as to exactly um, what they look like, how much they might be, and there is absolutely no guarantee um, that they will be achieved. And so I guess therein lies one of the biggest challenges. The proposal for change has been fundamentally driven by the future costs that have been anticipated and the government's belief that in order to afford those costs, that this aggregation and this model um, needs to be undertaken. And against that has been a lot of concern over the loss of control, the loss of input, and I guess those other things that were contained on the slide about the matrix around governance and future decisions and regional priority and how do local people and consumers um, have input into it. So there, the challenge for councils is going to be weighing up um, the potential future costs, um, the real realistic expectation of how they may or may not be achieved, against the widespread community concerns about loss of ownership, loss of influence, loss of local um, priorities. 
Uh, and that is going to be a significant challenge. And should the opportunity uh, be provided by the government and next steps for council to make a decision around whether they are opting in or opting out, that is likely to form the basis of the consultation that we will undertake with the community um, at whatever point in time um, we are expected to do so. So I think that's a, a, probably a good place um, to draw a conclusion. I'd just like to thank everyone who's both submitted questions in advance um, or asked questions uh, over the um, course of the webinar. Uh, we will put this recording uh, and the slides and information that's been contained with it up on our website, uh, should people wish to refer back to it. Uh, and again, um, I wouldn't say I look forward to the future opportunity to consult further with the community about this, um, because it is going to present some significant challenges. Um, but once we hear back from the government on next steps and timeframes, uh, we'll be sharing that with the community in due course. So thanks for everyone's attendance input. Um, and Thank we'll you. no doubt see everyone in the future. Thank you.